I'll sing the achievements of General Lud. Now the hero of Nottinghamshire. Brave Lud was to measure of violence unused till his sufferings became so severe that at last to defend his own interests he roused and for the great fight did prepare. A pean there from anarcho rockers Chumbawamba to General Ned Ludd. In case you're racking your brains to remember whether he was second in command to Nelson or Wellington, relax. He was part of the same regiment as Captain Swing. In other words, a fictional character created to symbolise a very real social protest. The movement that brought Ludd to prominence still lives on in our language today. I've been called a Luddite myself because I can't text and I don't have an iPod. But being a techno klutz is a long way from the actions of the first Luddites 200 years ago. In 1811, a group of skilled cloth workers burst into a factory near Nottingham and smashed up the new machinery that threatened to put them out of work. Their story became part of the bigger narrative of the Industrial Revolution. An historian E.P. Thompson was just one of those who interpreted their loom-lashing frenzy as the first instalment in a historical soap opera called Class Struggle. Chief scriptwriter won Karl Marx. The Luddite name endured long after the historical detail had faded, but in the present day, as skilled jobs are being replaced by technology around the globe, is it time for us to reach for the lessons of history from two centuries ago? Well, with me now is social historian Katrina Navakas of Hertfordshire University, and down the line in Exeter, the historian Jeremy Black. Katrina, could you explain for us, who actually were these first Luddites? Well, the first Luddites in March, April 1811 were, as you said, from Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire, Midland counties. And they attacked frames um, which made stockings. It's the main industry in, in Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire. So they were aggrieved at the fact that these new frames were producing cheap stockings which were taking away their skill, taking away their independence. So there was a big push in the spring of 1811, so I guess it's the the 200th anniversary of it um, this year. And what did they think that smashing the machines would achieve? I mean, I can quite see why it'd be an outburst of frustration and rage, but would they not have just thought that someone else would bring in some new machines fairly soon afterward? These machines are quite costly, actually, Um, especially the... Um, power looms that we see in Lancashire and the North West, which, um, you know, t- take up a, a large amount of space. So these are attacks on property, they're attacks on the livelihoods of the manufacturers. Um, and what they were protesting against wasn't just the machines themselves, but the whole system that they represented, which was that these manufacturers were becoming much more enamoured by Adam Smith and free market um economics and these machines represented the taking away of their independence and their skill and leaving things to the market the the invisible hand so this isn't just um opposing technology because um they're resisting change they're resisting a particular type of change which they see is is taking away their skill and Jeremy, it's not just a story of social history and class struggle, is it? It's also a story that has to be understood against the background of England at war. Yes, in 1811, Britain is isolated against Napoleon and the war against France has in fact helped to precipitate social strain in Britain, which is one of the background factors for Labour discontent. But it also reminds us, I mean, you look at the response of the state, which was eventually to deploy over 12,000 troops, that was because that this was a major threat to, to Britain at a time when it was in desperate problems. And I think there's an interesting parallel here. One tends to forget, for example, when looking at Ireland in, for example, 1798 when there was a rising, or indeed in 1916 when there was a rising, that Britain was again at war in a very vulnerable situation. And therefore the narrative that one has of domestic discontents or discontents within, within the British Isles has to also be placed within this broader framework. And, of course, a lot of the magistrates who were putting down this disorder... Remember, we don't have a police force at this time. A lot of the magistrates had served in Ireland in 1798 to put down the Irishmen. So they're, um, they're 
obsessed with the fact that a lot of these Luddites perhaps are Irish, which they aren't, but that's how they see things. OK, Katrina, the idea of smashing machines, perhaps to us 200 years later, looks like an understandable but doomed attempt to try and stop the march of progress. But some historians, I mean, I mentioned E.P. Thompson, suggested that the Luddites were an important part of reshaping class relations. I mean, were they more than a dead end? Were they actually part of shaping a wider stream of history? They're certainly part of the wider trade union um, development in this period. So trade unions are made illegal in 1799. They're not made legal again until 1825. And But trade unions develop in different ways. So this is just one strategy um, uh, across uh, various ranges of, of tactics that um, workers use to defend their interests. And Jeremy, would you agree that this isn't just a historical dead end? It is actually an important part of the formation of a different way of understanding the working class in Britain? Yes. What is interesting, of course, and this goes back to programmes you've had on how we look at national history, is that most people, for most people in Britain today, the kind of tradition as to how the working class developed or a view of the working class developed and how trade union organisation developed, which was so strong as an issue when people talked about national history in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, is now really gone away. I mean, there are obviously specialists who know about it, but if you were to ask the average person, they wouldn't have the faintest idea who the toll puddle martyrs are or indeed who probably the chartists were. And in part, I think that is that reflects the extent to which the trade unions appeared increasingly irrelevant in the latter days of the 20th century and in part changes in the Labour Party. But there's also a rather interesting issue which you've raised, which is this, that class context, class structure as an issue in history has been overlaid by the sort of faddishness of interests in ethnicity, in gender, in sexuality, and that has in a sense meant that we've moved away from concerns about the basics of social and and economic organisations organisation and development. Although I wouldn't want to sort of portray these Luddites as class conscious workers in the way that E.P. Thompson did and the Marxists did. This is about defending trade identity rather than sort of the, the working class as a general And, uh, Jeremy, isn't your statement actually based on a fundamental uh, misrepresentation, which is the idea that gender is entirely separated from class identity? After all, one of the ways in which people understand the Luddite movement in a way that they wouldn't have done in the 50s and 60s is as one that involves women as well as men. You're absolutely right, but the point is that people can only pay attention to so many factors. If you're teaching a class, you can only cover so many things in an hour. And I think there is no doubt at all that, although obviously people who talked about gender and sexuality and ethnicity argued that in fact it was perfectly compatible with pre-existing concerns about what they saw as social justice or social order or social identity. The fact was that in fact it did crowd out this other, uh, these other issues. As far as Katrina is concerned, I agree with her that class consciousness was not quite the same thing and in fact I would make the same point today. Often when trade unions are militant today, the people who suffer most are in fact other workers, particularly other unskilled workers and that in a sense links, I suppose, people like the Luddites with, I suppose, people like Bob Crow today. Well, the Luddites were part of the wider trade movement which was trying to defend skill against unskilled workers. So, um, Rani has mentioned the um, women issue. Actually, most trade unions in this period are fighting against female labour because that would bring wages down. That's a whole part of um, Smithian economics is that um, the manufacturers want women and children to work these machines. And that is actually not necessarily relevant today, is it? After all, it's often been said, I mean, not necessarily correctly, but it's been said that trade unions today tend to be more defensive of male manual labour than of female. And another interesting thing, I guess, about the, the Luddites, we don't really have this parallel today, is that um, they're cross-dressed. Um, we have these General Ludd's wives. The most famous incident is in Stockport in 1812, where they're led by two men in women's clothing. Um, so they're trying to subvert those gender roles, partly to make fun of them, but also to scare the manufacturers. You would find it quite scary if you were um, approached by two burly weavers in, in women's clothing. It's quite shocking. I should add that we don't know of any major trade union leaders in Britain <laughs> today who are cross-dressing, or at least not ones that we can mention on air. But, Jeremy, isn't that one of the ways in which the elements of, you know, you're being slightly mocking, I have to say, about the idea of sexuality as part of the trade union story, but actually the understanding of gender roles in the way that Katrina's just said is actually a fascinating no. and little-known facet of the story. Oh, yes, yes, I'm not being mocking. What I'm arguing is that whereas scholars working in the 50s would have given much more emphasis to economic 
uh, structures, the emphasis on on gender and other issues that subsequently came on, came in helped to crowd it out. And indeed, look at what economic history has become. Economic history has largely moved away from a subject dealing with production and become a subject dealing with consumption, which lends itself to a more social history component. And I think the other point I'd like to make is this question of what has happened to the 19th century. I think that now we are in the 21st century, now that we're in a new millennium, the 19th century, particularly the early early decades of the 19th century, an area before photographs, before film, obviously, is it, to many students in particular, less so to the academics, but to many students is a really dead age. And whereas, you know, E.P. Thompson, who has already been cited, might have been regarded as a major figure, may still be regarded by some scholars as a major figure, I have to tell you, for most young students, he's completely as with the dodo. And I'm not sure this is necessarily healthy, because although I certainly am not on the left and nobody's ever suggested I'm a Marxist, I do think it is important to discuss these issues about industrialisation, about why Britain became a major economic power and what consequences this had. And quite frankly, I think a lot of modern studies is very faddish and very concerned with socio socio-cultural issues which don't relate to these crucial and core economic and indeed political issues. Katrina, perhaps one of the best-known economic historians working today is Neil Ferguson, who's also very openly on the right wing of the field. Has economic history and has the history of industrial capitalism been given over to the right while the left wing of history has taken on the issues of cultural identity? I think the split's not so um, divisive as that. I think there are a new generation of scholars who are working on these issues of trying to bring economics back to um, the social and cultural elements of labour history. So there is um, a wealth of new material on Captain Swing, who's the agricultural equivalent of General Ludd. I myself work on Ludd, so we're always um, looking towards um, economic reasons. We don't reject economics as a, as a big factor in what causes um, this resistance or what causes change in the early 19th century, but you can't isolate it completely from the social and cultural aspects, such as um, men in dresses. So perhaps the early 19th century still has something to tell us in our own age of economic turmoil. Jeremy Black and Katrina Navakas, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed.